house prices are crashing down in Australia with forecasts they'll have fallen by 20% from their peak by the end of this year in Sydney and possibly much beyond that. But houses are still hideously expensive. So what's the answer to housing affordability? We've got two questions from listeners that we'll look at today on the Debunking Economics podcast with Professor Steve Keen. I'm Phil Dobby. Welcome along. All right, Steve, we are going to combine two requests uh, for a podcast today. One from Peter Verhoeven, who says, rent control, a good idea. And another also related to housing affordability from Carl Giannarakis. Giannarakis. I think that's how you say it. It'll do anyway. Uh, change your name if, if I've got it wrong. Uh, how much harder is it for young Australian first home buyers today than it was for buyers who bought prior to the introduction of negative gearing? So, uh, and look, you know, there are two questions we'll take on board, but let's look at, look at what's ha- happening in the housing market in Australia. Canada now as well is, is starting to move the same way. But first of all, um, Australia's just had a budget. Uh, negative gearing... Uh, has changed. It hasn't helped, has it, uh, in Australia? Because it's not the real cause of the housing bubble. That's surely down to low interest rates. And yet, here's the interesting thing. You know, Australia's got not got the lowest interest rates. There are countries with far lower interest rates that haven't got the same issues. So what makes Australia and Canada so different from those countries that have, you know, ridiculously low interest rates? Oh, dear. You know, you're back when you're getting me saying my favourite word again, debt. Yeah. I knew we'd get onto it pretty quickly, but I mean, but long. but but that debt is encouraged, isn't it, by the fact that you're not having to pay, you know, high interest on that debt. That's, so that's what that's ranks right. up the debt. So why yeah, wouldn't that happen everywhere where you've got low interest rates? Uh, because it isn't low interest rates alone that are the story. What what actually is the story is is that the positive feedback and the, this is this using engineering term, but the positive feedback can be a bad thing. In fact, normally is a bad thing. Positive feedback between. Uh, the the level of house prices and the level of new mortgages. And that is what causes a bubble and drives up house prices. And that's what's driven rising house prices in Australia. And things like negative gearing have simply kept that uh, positive feedback loop going longer than it's going to continue going in other countries, such as obviously America and then before that, Japan. But I would have thought disposable income would have something to do with this as well. So if you've got wage, because wages are quite high in Australia compared to lots of other places, lots of costs are lower, except for housing, of course. You know, you pay less for petrol. Uh, you know, you can, aside from housing, well, it used to be the case anyway, that living in Australia wasn't terribly expensive. Uh, and, you know, so you had a bigger disposable income. So more people would put more money into housing because what else to, would they do with that? But that would mean the U.S., has the most unaffordable housing, and it doesn't because for some reason that's not happening there. They've got high wages, but house prices haven't risen. Well, it's really because the, uh, to a large degree, the amount of money you've got uh, from your income has is trivial uh, as a factor in determining house prices, and mm. this is the problem. What really helps determine house prices is how much mortgage debt you're willing to take on. And... If you think about, uh, if you go back to the 1950s and 60s, I actually, I'm currently writing a piece which is taking you back to that wonderful uh, Frank Capra movie with Jimmy Stewart, It's a Wonderful Life. You remember that one? No. We, you, keep, ah. you, you keep on assuming we're the same age. We're not. So. Oh, do you? Because you, you're young, and aren't you? Okay. <laughs> well, it did come out before I was born, but it, 1940, it came out in 1946, actually. Uh, but it's, it's a story of a, effectively a guy managing a savings and loans institution at the time. But back in those days, um, and back in my day, even as my father would say, uh, and I've been forced to say too, uh, if you wanted to get a house loan, you had to have a 30% deposit. Yeah. Now, even so, if you have a 30% deposit. And, th- and then the rest of it would be three times your, or two and a half times probably yeah. your income. Yeah, yeah. What, you, what you've got is you, you've got, but you, the thing is you're buying, 70% of what you're buying the house with is mortgage debt. 30% is your own savings. Yeah. Now, what's happened over time is that 30% targets, oh, that's too high. Let's reduce it. Let's make it 25. Let's make it 20. Let's make it 15. Let's make it 10. Let's make it five. Let's make it zero. Let's give you 1.2 times as much money as it actually takes to buy the house. Yeah. So you can well, buy the furniture. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, you know, send the mother-in-law on a holiday. Um, so this, this, this is the... That that rising amount of mortgage debt over time has been allowed by deregulation of the financial sector, uh, but it's amplified what already existed, which was that the, the predominant factor in determining the level of house prices is the level of new mortgage debt. 
And as the level of new mortgage debt rose, because we accepted a, a higher loan to valuation ratio over time, uh, and we had this feedback process as well, you drove up house prices. But to keep it happening, the rate of change of new mortgages had to be positive. And for a full explanation of why that is, you have to listen to the full version of this podcast. You've just had uh, the beginning of a half-hour discussion on house price affordability. To hear the full version, you need to subscribe at debunkingeconomics.com or become a supporter of Steve Keen on Patreon. Go to patreon.com forward slash Prof Steve Keen, and if you pledge ten dollars or more support each month to Steve's uh, research work, then you can get access to this and all the other podcasts in the series. And there's a heck of a lot of them now. Uh, that's it for now. I'm Phil Dobby. Thanks for listening.